Darkcast Network, the light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. Four-year-old Cody Bigsby was reported missing on January 31st, 2022, when his father, Corey Bigsby, said he woke up and found his son's bed empty. A search immediately ensued, and police took Cody's father, Corey, down to the station for questioning. This interview turned into a brutal interrogation that spanned days and led to Corey being arrested on multiple charges of child neglect. Corey has remained in jail since then, and questions have been raised regarding his mental competency. After several hearings, a grand jury was convened, and on June 5th, 2023, Corey Bigsby was indicted for the murder of his son, Cody. This week, we're updating you on the efforts to find Cody and taking a look inside of this heartbreaking case. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell you the stories of those who never came home. Today, I want to tell you the story of Cody Bigsby. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. back everyone welcome back ethan and i are on vacation with our family as you are hearing this and as we're recording it we are literally hours from getting on a plane and i just uh brought him down to the basement to do this classic timing classic That's great yeah so um we will be taking a little bit of a break after this episode with our normal content but we do have some fun things coming to you from our dark cast friends which will be in your feed But before that, you know, before we left town, before we did everything, I just want to talk again about Cody Bigsby, the missing Hampton, Virginia boy who we covered earlier in this season. There's been a lot going on with his father, Corey. And as I mentioned in the intro, we do have an indictment in this case. And as soon as I read about it, I went right back to the case of Orrin and Orson West because there are some incredibly sad parallels here. Cody Bigsby was born on January 12th, 2018 to Corey Bigsby. Corey's mother's name has not been made public. Um, He has seven siblings in total, but at the time of his disappearance, he lived with Corey and his three brothers, a five-year-old and two-year-old twins at Buckrow Point Townhomes in Hampton, Virginia. So all of these four siblings had the same mother, but Corey had custody of all of them. And then he has three other children, I believe, two or three other children from a previous marriage, and they're older. Got it. Corey Bigsby was in the Army from 1997 to 2017 and worked as a cargo specialist, achieving the rank of sergeant. He completed two deployments to Afghanistan and two to Iraq before retiring on disability. Corey is also said to have PTSD from his time in the Army, which we will mention a little bit more later. He also has a history of violence. On July 23rd, 2018, Corey was arrested for assault and battery on a family member. The complainant was his partner, who was pregnant with Cody at the time. But the case was dropped in December of that year because she refused to continue to cooperate with the prosecution. Then on February 9th, 2019, just a few months later, Corey was arrested for the same offense, but I'm not sure if it involved Cody's mother or not. This case was also dropped the next month. So Corey actually doesn't really have a criminal record. Um, He has, you know, speeding tickets and things like that because these two charges never ended up going to trial. Right. Yeah. On Monday, January 31st, 2022, Corey says that he checked in on Cody around 2 a.m. and the little boy was asleep in his bed. When he woke up around 8.30, Cody was gone. He searched for his son, but when he couldn't locate him, he called 911 at approximately 9.06 a.m. Local police joined by the FBI and the Virginia Department of Emergency Management performed a grid search of the area. Hampton Fire also assisted and helicopters and drones were deployed. Though law enforcement performed a thorough search of the area, they were criticized for not issuing an Amber Alert for Cody. 
And we talk about this all the time because Amber Alert requirements vary from state to state, and that can be very frustrating. And Virginia is one of the states that requires a belief by law enforcement that the child is in imminent danger of serious bodily injury or death, and that there is descriptive information about the child and the abduction. In this case, police didn't believe that they had enough evidence to show that an abduction had occurred, so the alert was not issued. I'm sure that we talked about this in the original one, yeah. but isn't there like some other level of alert that they could have issued? I don't, I don't, I'm not 100% familiar with yeah. Virginia's. Yeah. And alert we do system. go over all of that in detail um, in the last episode, I believe. Um, it is one of those things where like it was a very quick and thorough search, but anytime an Amber alert isn't issued in the case of a missing child, like there's always public outcry, even if other alerts. Yeah. are made and we saw that with michael vaughn too because That's michael true. vaughn they did this like statewide alert but he didn't get an amber alert but yeah they really just didn't have any evidence of an abduction and you know one of the reasons for that is because police were looking pretty hard at Corey bigsby from the very beginning it's interesting when you look at the cases and how law enforcement like kind of plays it you know, plays their hand in similar cases. So going back to Orrin and Orson West, Trezell West gave this story about how his kids wandered out of their backyard while he was gathering wood and like nothing about it made sense from the beginning. Mm -hmm. But the um, Cal City police chief kind of like played it very cool, very like, you know, they're being cooperative, like the parents um, are helping us out and oh yeah we took their other kids into you know into into a uh, cps custody but like that's normal that's just what you do in these cases you know like he was playing it very like no it's fine but hampton police chief mark talbot did not do that in this case like he kind of went the opposite way and at a press conference on february 1st so the day after cody was reported missing he told reporters who asked if they had a person of interest quote there is a person of interest. We are most interested in Cody's parents. But then the next day, he did clarify that they weren't actually looking at Cody's parents, just Cody's father. Chief Talbot told reporters, quote, I'm going to provide some clarification on the person of interest in this case. The person of interest in this case is Cody's father. His name is Corey Bigsby. He is a 43-year-old Hampton man, end quote. So, like, he came right out with it. I mean, he said that two days after Cody was reported missing. And, it, you know, and in the West case, it was like months before anybody in law enforcement publicly stated that they suspected the Wests of anything. Yeah. Well, you also have to think about the, the two different stories, right? I mean, in the West case, I feel like it's slightly more believable that they could have wandered off through like a back gate, right? Right. So in this case, he was, you know, asleep in his room in a secured house. And there's- With three other children. With three other children, right. Yeah. And there's presumably no evidence of break-in or anything like that. So, I mean, you can pr you can roll out his story pretty quickly, you know? Yeah, I mean, I don't think either story made any sense whatsoever. But yeah, I mean, I get what you're saying for sure. So Corey Bixby, um, on January 31st, went down to the police station voluntarily to answer questions, which is typically what does happen in these cases. But he ended up being kept there for days. On February 3rd, his lawyer tried to get in to see him, but he wasn't permitted. Police told the lawyer that Corey was still there voluntarily and had not requested an attorney. Now, after our original episode aired, I caught some flack around this whole thing from some listeners who thought that like I was defending Corey. And to be clear, I was not. However, I do believe that everyone deserves to have their civil rights. And it did appear to me, who's just, you know, some person recording a podcast, that Corey Bigsby's civil rights had potentially been violated. You know, while it seemed very likely that Corey was responsible for Cody's disappearance, a multiple day interrogation in which it is later revealed that the suspect did, in fact, ask for a lawyer several times and was denied. Like, it, that just doesn't sit right with me. No, nor should, should it. And, you know, and just from a practical standpoint, like, they could have fucked up the whole case. They may still have. 
Yeah, I mean, it doesn't seem as though they have just because. So basically what ended up happening after um, the interrogation footage was reviewed and it was shown that he asked for a lawyer multiple times is everything after he asked for the lawyer was deemed inadmissible. Right, because it's fruit of the poisonous tree. Exactly. However, he admitted to leaving his kids home alone prior to asking for a lawyer, which is how he was still able to be charged for abuse and neglect. So they've got that. And none of this was related directly to Cody's disappearance. So anything in that interrogation, they didn't need for any future case about Cody's actual disappearance. This is only related to the neglect charges. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm glad that they got caught because... If that's like the type of shit they were pulling, like I would have hated to have had them, you know, interrogate him later down the road and, you know, pull the same things and then get more important things tossed out of court. Right. That same day, February 3rd of 2022, Corey was arrested on seven counts of felony child neglect. According to the arrest warrant, and again, this was before he asked for a lawyer, quote, Bigsby confessed to leaving the children alone for over three hours on December 13th, 2021, so he could buy a vehicle in Norfolk. The three youngest children were left home alone during this transaction. The children were left without a means or ability to communicate emergency services, end quote. And Cody allegedly told detectives that he did this because the four children were were too much of a burden to take with him when he left the home. And a similar situation allegedly occurred on January 25th, just under a week before Cody was reported missing. Then on July 6th of 2022, the seven charges Corey was facing increased to 30. A source told WTKR that the new charges, quote, include 15 charges of child neglect for leaving the children home alone. Four more charges of alleged child abuse and two additional child neglect charges in connection to those child abuse charges. Although two misdemeanor charges were added for failure to secure medical attention for an injured child, end quote. Instead of the two instances of leaving his young children home alone with which he was initially charged, the new indictment cited seven separate occasions and said that they were left home long enough for it to be considered, quote, a reckless disregard for human life, end quote. As 2022 wore on, Corey fired his attorney and had six bond hearings in which he was denied bond in each. As the months wore on, concerns grew around his mental status. His trial was originally supposed to start in November of 2022, but because of all of this stuff with his mental status and all of these bond hearings and other hearings, that quickly got pushed back. On December 9th of 2022, a judge ordered a medical examination in order to determine Bigsby's, quote, competency and sanity, end quote. On January 27th, 2023, a hearing was held to discuss those findings. In it, two doctors told two different tales. The court-approved doctors said that Corey was competent to stand trial. In these findings, it's mentioned that mental health staff at the Hampton Jail said that Bigsby has reported hearing voices, had made references to seeing children tapping on the windows of the jail, and said there is a machine in his head telling him to do crazy things. That does not sound like somebody who's competent to stand trial. Yeah. So this had all come from like mental health staff at the jail. Mm Mm-hmm. So when Corey was interviewed by a psychologist in January of this year, he said that none of that was true and that he had never needed psychiatric treatment, saying, quote, there's nothing wrong with me. I don't need those services, end quote. All right. There seems to be a lot of back and forth like that. He'll say or, you know, do something that seems questionable, but then he'll be like, oh, wait, no, that didn't happen, or I'm fine, or I did it because of this, or whatever. Now, for this hearing, the defense also hired its own doctor, and the defense's doctor said that Corey was not competent to to stand trial. However, this doctor wasn't on the court's list of approved doctors, so the judge did not allow this assessment to be used. 
He did, however, order a second examination due to the conflicting findings, and another hearing was set for March 31st of 2023. So basically, you know, court-appointed doctor said, oh, yeah, he told me he's fine. He seems fine. But even though um, the judge said that he wasn't going to take the defense's doctor's findings into consideration, I guess the fact that there was this conflict was still enough to say, you know, maybe we should circle back to this. Well, yeah, I mean, the judge is probably doing a little CYA f- on the for the appeal. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. It's not abnormal um, at all when there's a question of competency for there to be multiple competency hearings and multiple examinations. Like, I think a lot of times it's not decided one way or the other after just one. So this seems to be in line with that. But this March 31st hearing seemed pretty wild. In it, the defense filed a motion to have the charges against Bigsby dismissed, saying that the Commonwealth uncovered new evidence in August of 2022 that wasn't turned over to the defense for months. Like, I don't think they got it until November of Mm. 2022. The evidence in question is a letter that Corey wrote in jail. The contents of this letter have not been released, but the defense contends that it shows clear evidence of Bigsby's mental deterioration. Uh. Bigsby's attorney, Amina Matheny Willard, was asked if the letter was a confession or a suicide note. She initially said that it wasn't either, but then she changed her statement to, quote, Because the statement is verifiably untrue, nonsensical, and bizarre, I do not consider it either one, end quote. Say that again? Okay, so reporters asked her, they're like, hey, what's in this letter that you don't want to reveal? Was it a confession? Was it a suicide note? And she's like, no, it wasn't either of those. But then, like, the next day she went back and she said, quote, Because the statement, meaning the letter, is verifiably untrue, nonsensical, and bizarre, I do not consider it either one, end quote. So she's like, like, he may say some things that may sound like a confession or sound like a suicide note, but the whole thing is like a product of mental illness, so I wouldn't pay attention to it. It's a nonsensical note, but are there elements of a confession in there? Are there elements of suicidal thoughts in there you know what i mean like uh, yeah it seems like there may be she also said that the contents of this letter changed the trajectory of Corey's trial and told the court quote he lost his son and then he lost his mind end quote now, what the hell does that mean i think they're trying to say basically that his mental health is deteriorating to the point where like he shouldn't be you know expected to stand trial for any of these charges And the reason it's getting so bad is because he's an innocent victim of the system, that his son went missing, he had nothing to do with it, and he's been persecuted for it, and it's just making him lose his mind. And this is the defense saying this? Yeah, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, cool. Like, prove it. (laughs) Right. Well, that's what they're trying to do. (laughs) Documents from this hearing show that a second court-approved doctor said Bigsby failed to understand the circumstances of his charges. In addition, Corey claims he has no recognition of the names of the children listed in the indictment that he had been parenting. So, yeah, the indictment like lists his four kids who lived with him. He's like, I don't know them. Mm. Okay, well, that's all well and good. But at the time that these crimes occurred, he was legally in charge of the children right right so charges still stand yeah in so my head. yeah exactly right and you know Corey's family has been talking uh, publicly a little bit apparently as they and an uncle are the ones who are like paying for his defense and they agree with the he lost a child and then he lost his mind kind of thing that the lawyer said saying that his mental decline is due to the fact that he's been held in jail while his son is missing okay like, I can believe that, sure. But the, the charges against him are from before his son went missing. Right. So, cool. Let's believe that. Doesn't change the fact that he committed these crimes previous to losing his son. Yeah. 
The judge did not dismiss the charges because this letter, you know, wasn't immediately delivered to the defense, but he did order Corey Bigsby to undergo restoration services at Eastern State Hospital. Now, restoration services are given to defendants who may not currently be competent to stand trial, but could potentially be with additional mental health care. So the recent case of Mommy Doomsday, uh, Lori Vallow, is an example of this. She was additionally judged not competent to stand trial, but then after some more mental health work, she was. Corey was due back in court in June, and that's when prosecutors dropped a bombshell. So everybody was expecting another status hearing and, you know, seeing if he's competent yet and and things like that. But on June 8th, 2023, it was revealed that not only was Corey found competent to stand trial for the abuse and neglect charges, but he had also been indicted for murder in the case of Cody Bigsby. Okay. Now, the indictment document itself is bare bones, so it doesn't give any insight into like the theory of the case or evidence or anything like that. But it does state that they believe the murder occurred on or about June 18th, 2021, nearly seven months before Cody was reported missing. That's interesting. I mean, that's huge. I don't think, you know, like I said in the previous episode, um, police had started asking people if they had seen Cody back in December of 2021. And so it did seem as though they didn't think that um, Cody had actually disappeared on January 31st, like his father claimed. But I mean, we're talking several months prior to even that. Now, we don't know where this June 18th date came from, but it could be related to that letter I mentioned earlier. So In more recent news articles, like from this week, um, the letter is now being referred to as a statement that was given to a correctional officer. Like I said, this letter was contentious because the defense claimed that the prosecutors slow walked it and should have delivered it sooner. But prosecutors said that actually they really didn't need to deliver it sooner because it had nothing to do with the abuse and neglect case and was related to the Cody Bigsby investigation, which, again, is two separate legal issues. Right. So they're like, yeah, we gave it to you, but like it wasn't related to this case, so we actually didn't even need to. Mm. I wonder if the June 18th date was somehow related to school. How old? Oh, well, he no, because he would have been three at that point. Or maybe daycare? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just wondering if like maybe that was the last known confirmed sighting of him. Well, so that's interesting because that's something that, you know, there everybody's obviously trying to figure out. Um now we can get some sort of insight into what was in the letter. Uh, Because around the time the correctional officer received it, a search was performed in Maryland near Washington, DC. Interestingly, I think that's the area where Cody's mom lives. And I don't know specifically where the search was versus where she specifically lives. But geographically, it is definitely closer to Cody's mother than where Cody lived with his father. Uh However, nothing came of this search. There was no trace of Cody, you know, nothing related to him. But it does seem as though that search was directly related to the contents of the letter. And, you know, this letter is really what pushed this indictment forward. Uh, And in addition to murder, um, Corey was also indicted for altering or concealing a body to prevent it from being found. That's interesting that they're charging him with that, you know, without having an actual body. Yeah. And, but that's, they did the same thing. um, If I'm not mistaken in um, with Paul Flores in the Kristen smart case, because even though they don't have her body, because their whole thing is, yeah, we don't have her body because you hit her. And that's basically what they're saying here. And I think they actually did that with the Wests as well. Now, back to the 
subject of, you know, the last time anybody saw or heard from Cody, according to one of Cody's aunts, she spoke with a little boy around Thanksgiving or Christmas of 2020. And to her knowledge, that's the last time anyone in the family besides Corey spoke with him. So now we're talking six months prior to this date of the supposed murder as the last time anybody else in the family had seen him. So so that's like a full year before he was reported missing. Yeah. So like I said, the indictment came as Corey was deemed competent to stand trial for his initial charges. After undergoing restorative treatment, a psychologist who examined him said, quote, during his hospitalization, Bixby's thought process was goal directed and did not contain overt delusional ideation, obsessions or phobias. He also denied having any auditory or visual hallucinations. A doctor diagnosed him with post-traumatic stress disorder and prescribed him medication, end quote. It was also mentioned um, that during a May 9th meeting with the restoration counselor, Bigsby also discussed a, quote, hypothetical plea bargain. Uh Though it's not clear whether that would be a plea bargain in the case that he's currently going to be on trial for or in the case of Cody's murder, which he had not been charged with at that point. Right. Now, we don't have any more information about potential evidence or even a trial date for the murder or actually even a new trial date for the abuse and neglect charges. When I learned that investigators believe that Cody had already been dead for months, I mean, like my heart broke. And I immediately just went back to Orrin and Orson West. The similarities are striking, especially with the statement from the aunt saying that nobody had seen Cody in months, which likely didn't raise a lot of red flags because of COVID. Right. And we saw that with Trizel and Jacqueline, like that was part of their actual trial defense is that, yeah, nobody saw the boys for months, but it was COVID. So that was totally normal and not suspicious. And then the other thing that I realized is that if this June 18th date was correct or, you know, if it was around that time, it also means that Cody never turned four. He would have been three when he was killed. There are still a lot of questions that obviously need to be answered. If you recall from our original episode on this case, Corey purchased a home on January 12th, 2022. He went under contract on that home in November of 2021. And so much like we saw in the West case, the number of children the realtor saw during the time that they worked together over those months could be a key part of either the defense or the prosecution's case, depending on what they saw. Right. Because, you know, as a realtor myself, I will say that, you know, you don't necessarily see the kids every time you meet with your clients. You don't necessarily see them at all, like during the process. I mean, I've definitely have clients who never brought their kids to any of the showings or anything. And I I've had clients who brought all of their kids to every single one. Uh Um, But typically whether it's closing day or, you know, at some point in the transaction, if there are children involved, you do see all of them. So I think that, again, that realtor is probably going to end up on the stand one way or the other. I would be curious as to what the um, what the prosecutors have, what their thought process is. Yeah, I mean, that's the biggest thing, too, because we just don't have a lot of information at this point. Um, well, yeah, and now they're not going to release anything. For sure, for sure. So, yeah, now it's a murder charge. Exactly. So. so we're probably just going to have to wait for the trial, which, of course, we will cover um, as we did with the trial of Trizel and Jacqueline West. Just like in that one, it's it seemed fairly clear kind of what happened from the beginning. You know, it didn't seem as though Cody was safe somewhere yeah but to see a murder indictment is just so so tough you know because you can always hope against hope and you know again an indictment isn't a conviction cody still hasn't been found yeah but this ending is absolutely devastating you know though i am always thankful when one of these cases that we cover does move forward so we'll be sure to keep you updated as this one progresses
Cody Bigsby was reported missing from Hampton, Virginia on January 31st, 2022. He is a black male with brown hair and brown eyes. At the time of his disappearance, he was approximately three feet tall and 60 pounds. He was four years old when he was reported missing. If you know anything about Cody or Corey Bigsby's whereabouts, please call the crime line at 1-888-LOCK-YOU-UP. That's 1-888-562-5887. Or submit a tip online at p3tips.com. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website, and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social, and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we will see you after our vacation with a brand new episode. See you then. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production.